Mother Knows Death presents External Exams with Nicole and Jemmy. Recently on Mother Knows Death, we talked about the unfortunate death of Mike Williams, who was a former NFL player, and he had died from multiple brain abscesses and sepsis due to a dental infection and poor hygiene. So I thought today it would be perfect if we talked to a specialist. So please welcome Dr. Stephen Lin. Hi, how are you? Hey there. Thanks so much for having me. Stephen Lin is a functional dentist, author of a best-selling book called The Dental Diet, and he is also known for his podcast, The Mouth Brain Connection, and his Instagram account at Dr. Stephen Lin. And you have some awesome videos on there and stuff, so I'm really trying to point people to your Instagram account because I learned so much from your Instagram, so it's really awesome. But before we get into this particular case and what you're doing with your book and social media. Can you first tell us how you decided that you wanted to be a dentist? Yeah. So, I mean, my, I was always actually into kind of sports. Um, you know, we have a, a, a code of football here called rugby in Australia, which is kind of like NFL. And I was, I played that um, during high school years and I thought, you know, I, I liked sports and I thought I wanted to get into kind of um, physio kind of things, but I found that um, that I actually was more kind of inclined into into the, the medical sciences, and I applied to both medical and dental school, and um, got into both. But um, the mouth really drew drew me in because of the the hands on aspect of it. So I found the dental school was much more um, connected to this kind of hands on connection, both with the patient but also the surgical side as well. So that really drew me into dentistry itself. And then I got kind of hooked with the whole um, connection between the mouth. And the entire body and in particular which is actually really interesting about this case is the connection between the mouth and the brain which is actually the cause of death with the case that you spoke about and that, that's actually what i've been following um yes yeah, in my whole career which is really interesting yeah that's that sounds cool so what when you so you went through dental school and everything which is it's a very vigorous program and everything and then you get out i i'm not sure exactly how dentist dental school works do you have to do like a residency type thing once you graduate how does that work so in some countries you do like i think in the u.s for the majority of most states you do do a residency but um for in australia i did a postgraduate degree so i first studied biomedical sciences and then i went into a postgraduate um dental doctorate uh degree where you come out and you're a practicing dentist. So you basically go out into um, private practice once you graduate. Um, and yes, yeah, so like that's kind of where my career um, started. And you know, you, you, you're right in terms of the dental um, education is very vigorous and it's very time intensive. And then you kind of think you're going to finish and it's like this kind of, you know, you're through the, the hard thing. But I found that through my career that you, there's a lot of questions popping up with patients with oral health and the things they're experiencing. And, and in a lot of cases, what parents were asking me about their kids and what their kids were experiencing with both crooked teeth, nutritional issues, decay, that weren't being answered by, by conventional textbooks. And so it led me into a kind of a deeper investigation as to why dental diseases occur and then actually led into the work of a, a dentist that went around the world in the 1930s trying to connect how uh, nutrition was driving the modern dental disease that we see today. Um, you know, dental diseases can cause death. They can cause um, infections that, that, um, that ultimately uh, can be life-threatening. And when we have these conditions, it's, it's uh, against our biology. So in my, you know, when I see these things in patients, I'm thinking, you know, this shouldn't be happening. You know, 36-year-old NFL players shouldn't be dying from dental infections of why is this happening and there's actually a big connection to nutrition and to how we eat and how we um how we nourish our teeth and bone system which is uh fundamental to human health and when you miss that then you get dental disease then all the other conditions flow on because of that and so all the other conditions like digestive issues uh metabolic issues like diabetes and autoimmune conditions all have connections with the fundamental um issues that we see in the mouth first and so 
I like to show people how oral health connects to the whole body and, and th that we all should be thinking that way. Yeah, it's really crazy with this case because this guy, he's so young, 36, and he absolutely did not have to die from this. This was just like going to the dentist, routine checkups, just brushing teeth and things like that and taking care of problems. And it seems he might not have really known that that was causing his problem. He probably had a really horrible pain in his mouth. But up until the day before he died, he was actually he's he's a former NFL. So he was working as an electrician and something hit his head. And the next day he felt really bad and went to the hospital. He actually, well, someone called 911. He was really bad gets to the hospital and they do a CT scan on his head and he has multiple brain abscesses, so clearly, and sepsis. So clearly it wasn't from the injury of whatever hit him in the head. And he just went on. I mean, he was alive for a couple weeks afterwards, but it, he was put on hospice and he died from sepsis. And they found out that, that there was abscesses in his tooth root. And it's just, it's so unfortunate to think that way, but since I, I don't really know if you're familiar with the way things are in America, but this is like one of my hugest complaints is that if I want to, I, everything is surrounded around paying to go to the hospital and for, we get health insurance and it's not covered. Dental insurance is usually not covered at all. I know that I personally pay out of pocket for myself and my children because I don't want to go to some like factory that is associated with my husband's insurance. And I think a lot of time, and I'm even fortunate to do that because a lot of times people just can't afford it or whatever. And I think that a lot of times people just blow it off because they don't, every time they go to the dentist, it's $500, $1,500. And it, but if I go to get major surgery and my colon removed it, it, it it's a $10 copay. You know what I mean? It's just, it's, I think that that's a problem in America at least. Well, it's a problem everywhere um, because, I mean, the problem is that the, the, the dental sciences and the, the medical sciences are disconnected. And, you know, you really notice that <clears throat> as a dental practitioner, as you go out into the world. <clears throat> so what happens is that basically, you know, medical practitioners aren't trained in dental medicine nearly at all. You know, they don't have any kind of oral diagnosis. So he, so this, this former NFL player had multiple tooth roots that were um that were basically uh cut off at the at the crown level so there was just a root left in the gum and you know so basically that there were, he had multiple dental infections and so this is probably why there are multiple brain infections as well but so that's a long-standing problem um you know and when you don't have access to dent to uh to regular dental care you know i know insurance in the u.s is is very kind of convoluted as to how you access it. And um, there's, a, there's a huge uh, economic gap, which is all around the world. The problem is, too, is that, you know, you'll go to a practitioner or you say that he wasn't feeling well a year or so before. It's very rare that you'll get a, 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 a general practitioner have any meaningful conversation with dentists to try to connect to any kind of systemic issue. So, for instance, those, the signs that he was having uh, inflammatory markers would have been in his blood for some time. The oral examination is super quick. You can see there's a problem. You take you take a, a dental 3D exam, you take a, um, an X-ray, and you can see an abscess there straight away. So you get straight to the problem um, that a, a general practitioner may pick up years down the track because they're not going to look in the mouth and they're not going to directly see that there's a tooth that's rotten inside. Um, that's then infecting the jawbone that is then running up into the, cr the cranial nerves, into, into the brain. Um, and there's, you know, we, we know that the bacteria, for instance, in the mouth um, has multiple roles throughout the body. You know, we know that it connects to heart conditions. So, so inflammation in the gums can link to certain types of um, infective endocarditis of, of the heart. Uh, but they also show that um, end-stage periodontal disease will have bacterial colonies that will then go and colonize in the liver. And then you have changes with type 2 diabet type diabetics with um, oral bacteria. So what happens is that the, um, the fecal bacteria of a type 2 bac um, diabetic is far different to, uh, to a person with a normal metabolism. 
But the oral bacteria is the first thing that changes, and it's actually the the um, the oral microbiome that is kind of priming all of these changes in the gut, and then what we pick up later um, down the track as a digestive problem. As you know, when people are getting their their, their colds resected and things like that, the mouth is is such a great diagnostic tool. And you know, you really mentioned it in terms of a healthcare application. If people had good access to um, to to dental care that was mindful of uh, how oral care fits to, to the rest of the body, we would have a healthcare system that is so much more efficient where deaths like like this, the case that we're talking about just don't happen. So I think it's really important to kind of think like that. It's like you save so much money. For instance, these uh, dental caries, so the, the whole that this uh, ex-player had in his teeth happened years and years and years and years before what was um, presented uh, when he went to the hospital with the, the head injury. So if he had preventative work again, preventative nutrition work, if, he, if they found those inflammatory markers early, it could have all been prevented, both in an emergency setting if the teeth are taking out. But if you go back a decade and you fix his diet and you and we get these, these teeth uh, under control, uh, then he's never going to have those, those issues that then unfortunately cause his death. It's weird because when I was in PA school, one of the first things when we started learning the GI tract is that the mouth and the teeth are the first part of the GI tract. So it is it's it's weird that in medicine, though, it's not counted that way. It's like, oh, these are these pretty little cosmetic things in the front of your mouth where they're they're so important, because if that doesn't work, it could just cause problems for the rest of your GI tract. So. It's interesting that you just said that because a couple weeks ago, I interviewed a GI specialist who was talking about like leaky gut and microbiome and stuff. And I know you just don't re really think about that. I guess it starts in the mouth and then that's how it it ends up causing pathology in the rest of the body, really. Absolutely. And, and you know, leaky gut and intestinal permeability is one of the biggest kind of progressions in medicine where where medical practitioners are kind of switching on to the fact that, hey, when your, when your digestive system is leaking, when the barrier isn't working well, you've got you know 90% of your immune system sitting in the gut. And then what happens is you get this crosstalk between what you eat and your environment and your immune system, and the whole thing goes haywire. And they're showing that you know chronic diseases are all connected to how the gut is interfacing with this barrier. So they said leaky gut, you get all these conditions like autoimmune conditions, digestive issues, um, and even the brain, like the gut-brain connection is a big discussion now as well. But uh, bleeding gums is the first sign of that intestinal permeability starting to happen. And it's also the first sign that you can measure the bacterial changes that are beginning to shift that will end up in being intestinal permeability or leaky gut. So if people had their eyes closely you know, uh, focused on their oral health, we, we can get such a powerful connection to preventive medicine that is like, okay, so you've got bleeding gum, now you need to fix your diet, how you're sleeping, how you're breathing. These kind of things are uh, easy preventative measures that we can get control of the whole system. On your Instagram, you show videos, I, and I like them because they're very quick and to the point, but they're very specific to, to children. And I have two, I have three kids, but I have two little kids that are still forming and when I when I watch your videos, I'm like, oh, my God, I'm such a bad parent. Like everything, <laughs> everything that you're saying not to do, I do. So I'm going to go through these things because I, I think that like lots of people that are listeners or parents and and I want to have some of your advice as far as as how to get your kids out of this or if you've done damage already, that's too late. Um, one of the things that you say is that kids shouldn't have cereal or pureed fruit. So. I mean, I feed my kids cereal breakfast for breakfast every day, and they have like those those fruit pouches. They like those things too. Um, and you were also talking about, which was kind of mind blowing to me, is that you have some control over your kids having crooked teeth. Can you explain that? Yeah. So the the dentist that I spoke about in the nineteen thirties showed that our diet in one generation, when you eat the modern diet. And, and when we go off ancestrally, what humans were, were eating for thousands and thousands of years, our teeth become crooked and decay goes up to 30% where the modern rates are. And kids are the biggest sufferers of dental decay today. You know, 50% of kids 
have a hole around the Western world by the age of 60. And these numbers are rising. And the issue is that we've seen it as a both a brushing problem and a, and a sugar problem. And the sugar problem is right, but it's superficial in the way that we understand why dental disease is happening. In kids, when we feed them you know, carbohydrate-laden food, so the studies show that both sugar and simple flours which turns into sugar. So when you chew like a bread or like a cracker or like a grain, it turns basically into sugar. The carbohydrate breaks down and that carbohydrate breaks to sugar and it's metabolized in a very similar way by the bacteria that fuels decay. So carbohydrates fuel decay in, in a very similar way as sugar. So that's why I, I try to get parents to kind of think, hey, when a child has carbohydrates, it's very similar to sugar. So um, any kind of grains, any kind of pastas, any kind of um, any kind of uh, you know the cereals and so forth, all has this these simple carbohydrates in them. And kids are just they're, they're just locked on. Once they have these kind of foods, they're, they're very difficult to feed anything else. I've got I've got five kids, um, all under five, and we've oh, kind of gone through this whole. Thing. It's 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 crazy. But like, so what I've tried to implement with them is like, so if you give them nutrient dense foods. Can we change their palate? Can we change the way their their um their food craving systems work? But the key is fat soluble vitamins. There's vitamin D that is actually the the core regulator of how the skeletal system grows and develops. So vitamin D is how our teeth mineralize, how our bones mineralize, and we are a population that is deficient in vitamin D. And this is what this dentist in the thirties showed that he showed that. Traditional cultures ate foods that were heavy in fat, soluble vitamins. So this is like fatty meat. It's like organs. It's like eggs, dairy. Uh, all of these things have fat, soluble vitamins. That's vitamin A, vitamin D, and vitamin K2, which um, not many people have heard of, that is actually a partner for vitamin D. And what they do is we know that vitamin D, for instance, when you're adequate in vitamin D, your body absorbs calcium. So if you're deficient in vitamin D, which everyone should get tested for, and even kids too. So if, if your child has any kind of dental issue, you should know their, their vitamin D levels because it's a simple thing. You can help re reduce their rates of decay and so forth. Um, and what happens though is that when you have low vitamin D, your, your decay levels will go up. So if, if we eat foods that are rich in vitamin D, you have to eat fat, you have to eat saturated fat, you have to eat foods that are whole um, you know, animal fats that, that carry these nutrients because vitamin D doesn't come in many foods. It doesn't come in, in grains. It doesn't come in breads. It doesn't come in um, any kind of, you know, fruit products, even vegetables. So plant products don't have these, these nutrients. They are only in animal-based foods that are heavily, um, uh, you know, based around the consumption of fat. So the, the, the idea of a kid eating fat instead instead of sugar is, is kind of a brain switch for a lot of parents, but it's, it's critical for their growth and development because it, it, it switches on all their hormones. It nourishes their skeletal system. It, it heals their gut. So the, the digestive system and the um, intestinal wall works well because animal products are full of collagen, which is full of the amino acids that line the gut, the gut lining. So for skin, we know the collagen is great for skin. We know the vitamin A is good for the skin. Well, the skin is a barrier just like the gut, and it's just like the gums as well. And so it needs a lot of vitamin A and collagen and vitamin D to have a strong lining. And you want kids to have a strong lining because children today suffer from these inflammatory leaky gut issues. They have swollen adenoids and ton tonsils. They have eczema and they have asthma. They have these inflammatory conditions because their gut lining isn't working well because they don't have these nutrients that that help them to form a strong immune barrier with the world so they're not having reactive symptoms. And then the flow-on effect, which is you know, quite a rabbit hole, is that once you get this inflammatory profile, you begin to breathe through the mouth. So a lot of kids breathing through the mouth at night and both noticeably in the day as well, this deforms their cranial facial, facial structure. So what happens is that the teeth begin to form crooked because they're not breathing well and they're not getting the nutrients. So... When you have these, this jaw then that is not growing as well, the airway isn't developed and the child can't breathe through their nose. Their nose is blocked up. Their adenoids and tonsils are swollen. They, they, their gut is inflamed and they have you know, in, inflammatory lesions and then they, their jaws don't develop. That's why kids get crooked teeth because they don't breathe well. 
and they and they're not getting the nutrients and the messaging of the body to grow and develop the face so that so that the 32 human teeth that we all should grow and develop which for the vast majority of human history um, have grown are now not developing in our children and you can spot the signs very quickly between north and five basically you have all the kids dentition the 20 teeth that pop up if there are any bite issues if there are any kind of problems like kind of mouth breathing or pacify use or thumb sucking or tongue ties or breastfeeding issues all of these things contribute to how the child grows and develops and so we can actually intervene now if you help a child in the earlier age, you can grow their palate. So we do this in our clinic all the time now where we grow and we do intervention orthodontics where we we, we try to get the, the child to eat better, but we also help orthopedically grow the jaw so that their airway opens up and that the child can sleep better and that their that their posture is better, they're standing straight, they're not kind of open mouth and, and tongue hanging out and so forth. That's how teeth develop. Teeth move as a result of what we eat, um, function and, and posturally behave. It, we think it's kind of like this end stage that it's already done, but it's actually a, an environmental input um, that we all control and parents have a big control over too. Yeah, it's interesting because it's really interesting that you're saying this because I have a nine and a 10 year old and my 10 year old eats pretty well and her teeth are pretty straight and normal. My nine year old has a ton of, pro she has a ton of problems. She was diagnosed with a weird uh, autoimmune thing called chronic non-infectious osteomyelitis and her blood, you know, we've been getting blood work. She's uh, inflammatory markers are high all the time. Her vitamin D was low, all of this stuff and her teeth are, are, are jacked, right? Like we say, so she has to get an expander put, is that what you're talking about? That thing they're putting on the roof of her mouth, like next week, she's getting that done. Um, so I do see, but but more importantly, she's a horrible eater. I can't, I have a hard time getting her. She doesn't really ever want meat. I can't even get this kid to, to want to eat a crappy, like a McDonald's chicken nugget. She just doesn't like meat and it's hard for me. So that was my next question is, is how do you feel about the, the vegan and vegetarian diet and like supplementing all of these things? Like if you're getting protein from pea and and you're getting um like vitamin d from taking vitamins is th is that an adequate substitute or not really uh yeah i mean so firstly i mean i i feel to you know, you know you, the the journey your daughter's going through like it's 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 good that you kind of picked it up now so because it can all be kind of changed so it's like but it's so many people now that are experiencing these you know these autoimmune conditions earlier on in life like do you remember kids that had autoimmune issues when you were growing up like no. this wasn't happening right like it just wasn't happening um and so but if we if we kind of go to the, the root causes of what causes an autoimmune issue um is that it's in it's the gut it's the, the intestinal permeability and then so if we heal the gut we can we can we can change that like it's completely reversible and then, so it's great that, like, so you've gone down the road of understanding the bloods and so forth. Um, so we know that she's low in vitamin D. So to me, there's, a, there's, there's kind of a bigger strategy here um, when we see a, a nine-year-old child that is developmentally, she's right in the big growth phase. So it's really key to do this kind of expansion phase now because her adult teeth are, being, are, are now replacing her kids' teeth. That happens between seven and 12. She's right in the middle. And their jaws are like jelly. They grow like jelly. It's amazing. And so if they do expansive myofunctional work, which is like intervention orthodontics, it helps to grow the palate. Now, there's a nutrient problem where, where we have deficiencies, which can, which can be helped through supplementation. There's a dietary issue where, the, and this is a problem with girls. I've got young girls um, and feeding them is difficult. Like we battle them to eat meat. It's hard. <laughs> Um, so it's like, this is a problem that all parents are experiencing. It's like, and there's this messaging out there that, you know, maybe, um, is kind of bad view and stuff that I think kids are picking up a fair bit too. Even on kids shows, if you watched everything they are shown that is healthy is all, 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 um, fruits and vegetables and there's nothing about eating meat. So I don't think it, there's something about the psyche there with kids that they're kind of a little bit turned off me in a sense. But then the other thing too is that the, the digestive system is very energy intensive to digest meat. 
And for a child that hasn't eaten kind of animal products for some time, or they've been offered, or they've had a condition where it's like it's it's affected their diet, it's like we have to kind of think of a strategy to get the digest, digestive system w- working so that they want to eat meat because they want to eat it. It's it's just that their body needs to kind of have the messaging right so that they so that um, they feel like they can because a person that is, for instance, transitioning off a of vegan to, to vegetarian diet will feel almost adverse to meat by the smells and by the um, by the, the, the digestive pain they have from doing that. So it's quite a process. So we, we need to think about how we get the digestive system working. Sometimes we need to um, digestive enzymes and so forth that help to break down um, foods because meats are broken down in the small intestine. So it's very quick in terms of the digestive process. It doesn't go into the large intestine. All of the, the nutrients are extracted from the small intestine and this requires bile release from the liver. So when a, when a person doesn't eat a lot of meat, you don't get a lot of bile release just by the functionality of it. So we have to, to prime all that to, to happen again. So sometimes digestive enzymes, sometimes things like, um, uh, you know, acid stuff like apple cider being just before, um, just before meals, like a, a very diluted um, uh, shot of it can help to, because we're trying to think of the acidity of the stomach. But supplements can help. Um, especially in children, uh, the the kind of most definitive way to kind of correct this kind of stuff in children um, is is kind of beef liver. So desiccated beef liver, you, you can somehow anyway sneak that into something that will give them this the full spectrum. I think it's difficult. Um, you otherwise, won't believe this. I made I made her a smoothie once, and I snuck two pieces of let um spinach in it just with the fruit. And she picked it up that it was off. <laughs> like it's hard oh, to just like yeah. make a strawberry smoothie and just put some like beef liver in there. She just, you know what I mean? Like I just think her oh, taste I, was. No, no, totally. I, I'm totally with you. Like it's like, I've, no, we would, so I would used to give cod liver oil to our kids. I would, I would just pour it in their milk when they were younger. And like they're all onto it now. Like they, they, they watched me at the fridge and they're like, um, if I pour anything in their milk, they're smelling it. And it's like, and like, so, and they're, they're on the five, right? So I, I can't do it anymore. So it's like, we have to sneak it in via kind of beef mints. And like, it's, it's really, really hard. And like, it's because their palates are kind of shifted to this modern kind of, you know, blander um, diet, you know, liver tastes really strange. So it's hard. Um, supplementation can work. So, so if we know, for instance, the child's low in vitamin D, um, vitamin D supplementation should be an absolute must because we know that that's, um, we know that there's there's benefits there, both to kind of raise the levels, but then for the, all the subsequent issues that um, associate with autoimmune issues, for instance, um, I'd be looking to get her levels, uh, you know, up, you know, probably between sixty to eighty nanograms per milliliter, um, which which may seem quite high, but we would want to see her her autoimmune markers come right down. Um, and you have to remember too that vitamin D also runs the immune system as well, so it actually um, there's on every immune cell, there's a vitamin D receptor. And so once the immune system gets enough vitamin D, it calms down. So all of the inflammatory autoimmune messages calm down. So the body needs enough vitamin D to calm the immune system down first. But then once it gets enough, then it has to go to work to start mineralizing the teeth and start mineralizing the bones. So you need an adequate vitamin D and support nutrients in order for the body to to then start to work on the teeth. First thing is to get the inflammatory markers down, the digestive issues uh, and the autoimmune markers, but then the, the teeth and everything come later. So high vitamin D levels is where we want to go with the support nutrients. Vitamin D should al- always be taken with vitamin K2. Um, we should be thinking about some kind of vitamin A potentially because it's a partner with vitamin D. Um, and then... The, the big one that I'm seeing a lot in kids, especially that don't eat a lot of meat, is iron levels. So iron is often, so often low in kids today and it affects their sleep. Um, and then so with iron, uh, just putting iron in is difficult. So you need B12, you need folate, you need the, the, the active B vitamins. And one thing that affects these is the MTHFR gene. Have, have you heard of that one? I, I think I've heard of it, but do you want to do you want to explain it? So the MTHFR gene is a methylation gene. And what it does is it's a very simple swab test that you can get um, very commonly in America. It's very easy to get. 
Um, and what it tells you is there's a, a couple of the genes that sometimes get switched off epigenetically. So it's not like in our inheritance, it, it's, it's like in our environment. And what these MTHFR genes do is they methylate path, um, nutrient pathways. So if a child um, or an adult has MTHFR, they, their nutrient pathways don't work very well. So, and these include the folate pathway, the B12 pathway, and the B6 pathway. And what happens is that they don't efficiently take in these B vitamins. So you, you eat and you, you can get these from plant foods, but they don't efficiently convert them into their active form. Then you get these systems that are all gummed up and they're not working. They have deficiencies, but they also have the buildup of what's called homocysteine. And that's something to check as well. So when you have high homocysteine, that's an inflammatory marker. That means your body and your liver is, is basically kind of trying to deal with this methylation pathways that aren't working very well. The end stage is often iron deficiency because iron requires all these B nutrients to work. But if a child has MTHFR, you can supplement the methylated, um, su the, the methylated uh, Bs that help the pathways move and the whole thing just works better. So the child is completely free of the problems of the methylation issue. Now that helps their metabolism start to work. Then we can start to think about, okay, so iron levels will hopefully start to come up because their, their um, Bs are working a bit better. Then we can start working on the fat cell vitamins, which are the real stores, the D, the A, the K2, that help to kind of build the bone and build, and build, the, um, and build the, the, the teeth as well. One thing too with palatal expansion is that often you get sleep issues. So when a child has a narrow palate, they struggle to breathe through the nose at night. And this will manifest with mouth breathing, teeth grinding, restless sleep, bed wetting, night terrors, so poor sleep. And poor sleep will make all of everything we've just spoke about worse because the child can't get rest and they are in an autonomic fight or flight um, sleep pattern. So doing expansion and, and building and teaching the child to breathe through the nose at night and giving them the structure to helps all of this as well. So when we work on the nutrients, when we work on the structure, then the child then starts to, to be you know, kind of a bit different because they're sleeping, well, they're feeling a bit better because they're rested. Like imagine, try, imagine choking all night, which a lot of children and adults are doing now. That's what sleep apnea is and how you feel in the morning. You feel anxious, right? And you don't feel like kind of, um, your digestive system doesn't work because your, your brain doesn't get to um, reset that through the night. So a lot of this is based in sleep and how all of these things tie together to make us feel. Yeah, it's it's all so interesting. It's kind of like overwhelming just to to think about all these different things that are going on in our bodies all at one time and how to control them, especially I feel like with adults, it's a little bit easier and kids you know, we just had the, the the same kid I was talking about blood work done and her iron's really low. And I'm trying, you know, I try to say like, okay, we're going to have to eat these foods. And she doesn't want, you know, she's nine. She doesn't want to. So it's just, it's just like eh, all the time. But as far as the vitamin D goes too, that's also a vitamin that we get from going outside and being in the sun, right? Um, That's true. The sunlight's important. Absolutely. Do you think um, that this like huge movement because if you ever go to one of the events like at my kid's school or something for instance every parent's out there like spraying all this suntan lotion on their skin do you think that that has some kind of effect as to what's getting absorbed it, it absolutely does so vitamin d is a very complex um pathway to get to its active form from sun um, it also involves the different rays of lights that you have at different at, at the different times of day. So uh, when you don't expose yourself, and I think this also includes when you, the age of exposure. So you don't get exposure to um, sunlight when you're young. You don't have the systems um, right to be able to absorb vitamin D to its active form. Um, and so the, one of the big factors too is cholesterol. So cholesterol is what is the precursor to vitamin D. So precursor is stored in the in the skin. Um, and, and you have the cholesterol, you have this cholesterol precursor in the skin. Light hits that precursor and then it travels to the liver to be converted to vitamin D. Then it has to go to the kidney where it's activated with magnesium to become the active form of vitamin D. If you don't eat the if you don't have a fat heavy diet and you you will have these these reactions to sunlight like burning. So it's like 
in 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 my kids, what I've done is like I've kind of made sure they've had a lot of you know fat heavy um, meat products and and you know butters and eggs and everything. They go out in the sun out and and they're like you know they've barely been burnt. But we live in Australia and the Australian UV is is very strong. We obviously don't fry them, but if they get morning exposure where you can't burn in the morning, right? Like you you you, you just kind of get exposure. Your body is primed for the 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 um, vitamin D creating um, light, which is between ten and and two p.m. Depending on your geographical um, latitude, uh, then your body's ready for it. So it's like just covering up kids is like kind of you know not the solution because you're not letting them go through this process of forming vitamin D. Um, yeah, they need to be like if you live in in you know the Arizona desert or something like that, they need to be covered up here or there, but. There has to be some kind of consideration as to how they're also getting the nutrient as well. Yeah, I've been trying to I I kind of have switched my tune. I used to be this like 100 percent because because I work in pathology, so I see cancer all the time. So I'm like always scared about this. And I think that there's just we in medicine in general, we go through these extremes that like, OK, it's been known that sunlight causes cancer. So just like don't ever have sun exposure again. And and it, there's a fine balance. So I have been this year, I, I've i been I, I bought half, if not 75 percent, as much of uh, suntan lotion as I normally do. And I let the kids go out in the pool for a couple hours and they come in and go out and come in. And we have we didn't have one sunburn at all that 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 had to be addressed. But they, they got a nice tan on their skin. And also I'm like they're getting they're getting what they need from the sun. So. I was just curious on your thoughts about that because a lot of people are just so anti letting you know letting your kids be outside without suntan lotion on. Yeah, it's it's a factor. Like when we think if if, if your children or they have any signs of vitamin D deficiency, like any kind of teeth, any kind of you know inflammatory or autoimmune condition, they need sunlight. They they do need it, and you have to be kind of mindful. You know, kids' skin's gentle, right? So like, yeah, of course you'll think about protection and everything, but. Um, one strategy that's kind of quite safe is like if parents are really nervous about it, take them out into the sunlight before 10 a.m. Because like before 10, you, they're not going to burn. Like it's, it, at the angle of the sun is, you know, they're not going to burn. Watch how their skin reacts to it and like, you know, feel comfortable. Because I know it, it's, um, you know, it, it's a little bit kind of uh, nerve wracking, like thinking about burns and cancers and so forth. But give them a few days where they just go out into full sun exposure before 10 a.m. and see how the skin reacts, and you know maybe take it to 11 a.m. after that, and then see you know how 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 they react to that. Because some kids will burn easier, and they have to be watched. So that might be a way to kind of step into it. What getting back to what we were talking about with the with the leaky gut and and um, the microbiome and everything. What do you think about? Um, oral allergy syndrome it's something that it's a weird thing that i had when i was a kid well i still have it now and then one of my kids has it too and my mom always jokes because she breastfed me till i was like two years old <laughs> and she's just like i did everything right with you i don't understand why you're allergic to everything and i i mean i'm telling every single fruit and vegetable i put in my mouth like itches my mouth at some point but i still i still eat most of them anyway and I don't feel like it gives me any additional problems, but especially with my little one, like I, I can't even really get her to eat vegetables be unless they're cooked. When they're cooked, it, it doesn't do it. Um, I'm just curious if that's part of that whole process or if that's a whole other thing. I would say it's related. So when, when so when we're thinking about kind of allergy, it's like your body telling you, oh, I'm not liking that, right? So like obviously we'd be listening to what, you know, it's kind of creating those reactions because it's like your body's saying, you yeah, know, I'm not that happy with that. Um, but the kind of, the um the the underlying root cause is is the is the gut lining. So remembering that the 90% of the immune system is down in the gut. When we have allergic reactions, so like stuff like, you know, like if if, if people are too allergic, it's their immune system that is not um happy with the environment. So it's like instead of thinking, you know, some people have like true allergies where it's like, you know, they kind of pee up, they kind of blow up and so forth. Like that's, there's a few kind of examples of that, but things that are kind of like just like inflammation like that, 
I kind of more think about it is that okay, there's something going on with the immune system that is um, that is uh, not um, that is making it not happy, and and it, it goes back to the, these deficiencies. It's like everyone ex, ex, um, expresses this differently, uh, and it's even the deficiencies are passed from a, a breastfeeding mother. So I'm really kind of tragically seeing this in a lot of um, young kids now whose parents are breastfeeding them and even feeding them, you know, animal uh, heavy diets um, because it's like an epigenetic thing that is, is kind of um, related to both deficiencies in the parents. So if the parents are deficient, if they don't have um, adequate nutrients, it passes by the breast milk. The studies show that vitamin D deficiency um, will pass through the breast milk from mother to child. So it's like we're passing on these these things um, that are slowly getting worse generationally, and then so then and then if you eat the modern diet, you're going to get you you keep going down this track. Um, so it really kind of takes um, a reconnection to to you know historical you know levels of vitamin D. So like it means kind of eating like liver, like it like it means eating liver with bone broth, which is I know it it, it turns like it's weird, right? Like um. Well, it's just weird for me because I've done so many autopsies and like I know it has a smell and the smell, <laughs> smell it smells the same in the cow as it does in, you know what I mean? Like I have like that weird correlation thing, but maybe, I mean, like I'm sure my dad ate it as a kid and stuff and it was fine, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> that's a totally good idea. <laughs> yeah, because I've done, you know, um, head and neck. Uh, dissections and everything and it's like yeah but the uh, the flesh side of things in but you know when you're actually kind of touching it and everything it, it's a whole other thing than, than buying something off, off a supermarket shelf which is probably actually part of you know part of the process too we are a bit disconnected with how that connection to um you know how food reaches the plate and so forth um but yeah like historically if you look around like traditional cultures had organs and and um, nose to tail um, eating in oh, every yeah. cuisine, any cuisine around the world. It's nose to tail. It's like liver, everything. It's, it's like they treasured these these parts of the animal because um, they knew it, that it created healthy kids. Like they knew it, and so the Native Americans, um, you know, they, they would the the buffalo. They would use every part of it, and they would eat like the even the um, the colon, like full of of feces even they would they would give that to females to eat because they knew the bacteria in that would create good fertility and so forth and the men would eat the, the testicles and so forth because it's full of testosterone and the bats are with vitamins um and the liver is kind of like the the most dense part of the um it's the most nutrient dense food on the planet it's where the body stores all the nutrients we kind of think of it as a as a portal for um for toxins and everything but it's actually where the body stores all the nutrients um and you'd probably follow that through uh you know through through all of this and everything how connect the liver is everything to the body um yeah it's, it's this weird kind of flip that we we've unfortunately gone through and it's difficult you know my kids i struggle to get my kids won't eat liver straight so it's like we have to hide it but um you know i Kind of as they grow up, I, I mean, I'm going to try to get them to to think of it in the way that, hey, you need to eat this. Um, but it's going to be a challenge, just no doubt about that. So now I have an idea. I'm going to try to make like a liver uh, cookbook. <laughs> it's yeah. like just thinking I really like to cook. And it's and that's another thing, too, because like when I was working at the hospital full time and my husband's a firefighter, so he works a lot, too. We I just didn't have time to like cook real meals. I just didn't. I was getting home at like seven o'clock at night every night. And now that I'm doing this, I'm doing the podcasting and writing for my website. I have more of a flexible schedule that I could cook like real dinner for my family almost every night. And I do definitely see a, a change with that. But it's funny because I'm just trying to think like, oh, what can I mix together to make liver taste more appealing to my family? <laughs> yes, yeah, totally. Take it one night. Yeah, there's a fair, there's a fair few kind of um uh you know like kind of traditional cuisines that have some ways to kind of hide that, but you can kind of hide it with you know sauces that kind of hide in liver um when it's cooked too much it's it gets kind of really the the smell comes out. The raw liver is actually it, there's far less kind of um taste to it. Uh, yeah, kind of if you, 
So if it's cooked much lighter and softer, so once it kind of it get you fried more, it gets it's hard and kind of tough, and it's, it's just not nice to eat. But like closer to you know raw, you know medium rare raw, it's like soft and like the taste is less overpowering. Um, and it can be diced up with regular mince. Um, pâtés are kind of a, a way that you know the French always used to do it as well. Um, but it, it takes time too. That's it, it's so true that you know. Things like you know bone broth and so forth it takes time. Um, it's 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 definitely a, a less convenient way, but there's there's ways to do it. You know, there's modern ways to um to to, to introduce this back to our family's diets. So that so in your book, the dental diet. Do you? I mean, obviously, you have this whole connection to the body, not just to for t- teeth in general. So is this stuff that you talk about in your book, like different ways to? introduce this kind of stuff into your family's diet yeah absolutely so there's a 40 day food plan in there with some meals and everything um liver kind of you know where where, where you can get it in um yeah the the kind of the the beef liver um uh, and the uh the mince mix i find is, is good but you know pâtés and things like that there's lots of recipes in there but there's lots of ways to kind of go about it but the, the dental diet is kind of my modernized version of what this this dentist was running in the 30s and the modern science as to the breathing and the craniofacial structure the nutrients the microbiome the bacteria like i was so interested in all this science that i was never taught in dental school and, and everything we've discussed here i wasn't taught in dental school so like i felt that parents out there needed to kind of know that hey you can change your your kids um you know trajectory with their health like and their teeth if they eat, eat better. And so that's why I wrote the book so that they could understand it, like trying to get the science simple. Like there's like three or 400 references in there, but I try to make it simple for people to understand. Um, and also too, that uh, we that there's practical applications and to kind of realize, you know, why we've got the cereals and grains on our, on our, um, on our breakfast tables now and how we can reprogram ourselves to, to change that. It's it's crazy because when I was working um, in the pathology department like 15 years ago, there was this pathologist and she was she was a GI pathologist and she was all on the leaky gut thing. And everybody kind of thought she was a fl- like they thought she was a flake and she was hardcore like, no, you know, and now I love it, it makes me feel good that she that she was right about everything she was saying, because everything she was saying sounded so good to me. And I, so I love that you that you went on Instagram and like, what, well, what did you do first? Did you write the book first or you started the Instagram first? Oh, I wrote the book. So I was, um, yeah, so I wrote the book first and I was actually training dentists. So I I wasn't that big on kind of socials. So my kind of first approach was just like, Hey, I better get this out to dentists. And I was going through America and, and, um, Australia and so forth with a training program for dentists to teach their patients how to kind of understand this stuff. And it wasn't cutting through the way that I would hope it to. And I got this book deal in the US, which was like huge, in, in um, which came out in 2018. And it got published in seven languages, which was like a big thing. I was like, wow. So the audience here is actually the consumer. It's actually the parents that are the ones that you need to switch the lights on because practitioners take time. Science is slow. Like the the um, your colleague, she was, she was stating published literature that was published about 15 years ago she was talking about this like manner of fact saying hey you've got to you've got to look at intestinal permeability this is important for disease risk and all of this was around for 10 years but it takes 19 years for published literature to really reach the the mainstream kind of applicable clinical um you know where patients are actually receiving it so that's where kind of a you know once the book came out i was like oh no we have to get this out to socials so that um, people can actually, you know, change this today. Because if they wait around for their doctors to tell them, you know, we're going to be waiting 10 years. So it's like, let's get parents out there changing their food and understanding how their their um, how their how dietary habits now and their cooking habits and everything can, can influence, you know, because kids' development is really important. Like this is happening right from day dot and it's happening right up until the 20. Wisdom teeth come in at 20. That's when it kind of finalizes. You know, at 12 to 13, that's kind of like, the the eighty percent, and then it can't. They go through twenty percent more development. But there's so much change that parents can make, you know, just by simple switches. Everyone's busy, and everyone's kind of, you know, um, you know, 
challenge with, with kind of dealing with this stuff, but like there are simple things that people can implement. It's, I say this all the time. Me and my friend talk about this all the time. Like we should have done something like this when the kids were six months old. Cause I feel like if you never in, introduce them to certain things, then they're not going to be, I mean, I guess they eventually go to school. Like I send my kids to school with lunch and they come home with stuff that I didn't even send them with. And I'm like, where'd you, oh, we trade, they trade all their food. So I guess eventually they would learn to eat other foods, but it now it it's, I, I sit there and I just feel so bad. Cause I'm like, why did I ever introduce them? The fruity pebbles like that? I'm the one that bought them. I brought them in the house and I feed it to them. It, but I, I, I want to make them eggs and breakfast every morning, but like now I feel like they're going to be like, no, I want my fruity pebbles. You know what I mean? It's hard. Holy moly. My son's about to go to school next year. And I'm like, it's all going to start once. He goes to school. <laughs> it's like, it's we, true. But, they have, we, they have a rule at the school that they're not, a, cause they're afraid of like a kid has a peanut allergy and all that, but they do it anyway. You yeah. know, they're kids. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. Really, and and like my kids are sneaking around and kind of like they're they're already onto what they don't have, and they ask me they ask me that does this have sugar in it and like stuff, and they're always trying. The girls are especially the most they are sneaky, like they are like my the girls are like kind of like they will grab like some if they see a chocolate or something they will grab and they'll run part in their room to eat it later and things like that, and like they are very very strategic with how they're getting their um you know their food, and we've got actually got um, three month year old twins. Uh, boy and a girl so it's like it's all gonna they're gonna have like this influence that I feel is not as controlled as what the first three had um yes yeah, so, look it, it's it's incredibly diff- difficult parenting is so hard and these things it's, it's obviously very easy to kind of talk about these things but ap- applying them to kids is it, difficult so like I I kind of just tell you know we see parents all the time we talk about this kind of stuff with kids that have a lot of issues in their mouth that you know you have to do what you can do and you know you have to make compromise and you know, kind of be at ease with it, like it, it is what it is. You know, we live in this society, this is where we're at. But if we're kind of switched on, and we, and we we know, for instance, if we're supplementing a kid vitamin D, and we know their B levels, and we know what's going on, and we and we know that you know if, if they're getting a nutrient dense kind of food once or twice or three times a week, that we're at least kind of making those steps. Like you know, all of those things contribute, and we just do what we can. Yeah, it's parenting was really hard. Oh, I know. Trust me. <laughs> I've been doing it my whole, well, you spoke with my older daughter earlier and she's, she's married and out of the house. She's 29 years old, but the little ones are, are, uh, you know, and, and it's like a whole new world that I'm raising them in. So of course it's, it's, it's the food is like the minimal problem of compared to like the other problems that are happening right now. Um, are you so are you like working on any other projects? Like what's going on with you? Uh, yeah, so we I mean our um we've just opened a new dental clinic called Helix Dentistry, but our um yeah, so uh my my podcast, the Mount Brain Connection, kind of explores this this um we we look at we get dental and medical specialists from all around the world to really dive down into these deep these areas that are the parents are struggling with like we have a big focus on parents but we have a big focus on adults too so adult sleep apnea is a big issue so we dive into those issues where how do we fix these things um you know in both kids and adults and actually we mentioned before that you said adults are easier well actually kids are a lot easier when you kind of because they're so malleable when they change so easy when you've got this problem and you kind of go back through the story you realize that all these things happen when you're kind of when you're a kid yeah as well. of course <laughs> Yeah. Um, and, and actually the interesting thing will be for your daughter when she eventually has kids going through this journey with, with her, um, you know, because obviously there's, there's that kind of um, what you've learned as a parent and going through and then what you see. Yeah. It's grandparenting is kind of like, yeah, a whole other thing too. So yeah. Um, my, my website's drstephenlin.com and we have a lot of resources and everything up there and, and just trying to get the word out through socials um, as well, you know, based the simple tips for parents to to really improve this for their kids' lives today. Yeah, your Instagram's awesome. I love it. Just the videos are like short, sweet, to the point, and you're like, oh, okay, that makes it all makes sense. You know, it's just a matter of putting it into place. But 
Thank you so much for being here today. It was awesome. And everybody should get your book. I, I see it's on audio too. So they're my favorites is audible books because then I could clean my house and do that and listen. So, um, and your Instagram too, they should definitely check out. And what, what's the deal with your, you have a podcast too, right? Is that yeah, so something podcast, you're actively doing? Yeah. So we've got a weekly uh, podcast coming up uh, and that's the mouth brain connection that's on iTunes and Spotify. And yeah, it's kind of these kind of conversations with, with doctors and um, yeah, just exploring, you know, problems that people are experiencing out of the world. Yeah, that's really awesome. Well, congratulations. You're doing awesome. And it seems like everything, every it's being well received, which is great because like I said, people were blowing this off years ago and now they're listening. And I love that. So thanks for being here for with us today. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. I, I hope it helps. And I hope, yeah, I'm really interested in diving into all the other episodes of your work too. <laughs> Thank you.